I just want to say I love getting to worship with FBC, uh, with my church family. Uh, today was the first time I got to actually take uh, communion with my oldest son, and that was just such a special moment. And so thank you, Gary, for leading us in communion. Thank you, Justin and Sarah and Jordan, for leading us in worship. That was such a, this is a, like a memory I'm going to keep forever. Uh, so I thank y'all for that. Uh, I'm Adam McMahon. I'm one of the pastors here on the teaching team. Um, and so I get to be used by God to dig into his word today. We're going to dig into Genesis 39. Um, we've been continuing through this series uh, through the Pentateuch, which is the fancy word for the first five books of the Bible. We like to use fancy words, and so it's the fancy word for that. So now you can remember that and tell everybody else. So I was having lunch with a pastor friend of mine a few weeks back, and, and he's been having, he's been at the same church most of his life. Uh, and so now he's getting closer to retirement age, right? And so he's looking back on his ministry. And, and by all accounts, it, it's been really successful. It's been incredibly successful. Every ministry he'd launched had grown his church. Every program he'd come up with had had this impact on his community. I mean, it was really amazing to get to know him and to get to see his experience. But over the last few years, his church numbers had gotten kind of static. They plateaued. Um, and by the way, I want to let you in on just a little secret. It's kind of poorly kept uh, in the American evangelical church that pastors judge each other by the size of our churches. You Maybe you didn't know that. So now you know. Uh, in fact, there's an entire organization in America that figures out who the fastest growing churches in America are. And they make a list every year, the 100 fastest growing churches in America. And those largest and the fastest growing churches, those are the pastors that speak at the conferences that all of us pastors go to, to hear how you too can have a fastest growing church. I mean, it gets a little sick and twisted. Uh, anyway, back to my, my dear pastor friend. You see, his church had stopped growing numerically. And as we sat over lunch and we were eating tacos, tacos are good. Uh, he tells me, he, he says this, and this was really shocking to me. He said, I feel like I've lost God's blessing. And he told me what was going on, how his church wasn't growing anymore, how he tried to launch these new programs and new initiatives, and none of them seemed to work the way that they had before for him. And he felt like he was hitting his head against a brick wall. And he was increasingly just frustrated by this. In fact, he told me this. He said, it's not just that I feel like I've lost God's blessing. I feel like God is cursing everything I try. I mean, it was dark. He was down. He was frustrated. He was in a really dark place. I've got to be honest with you. I did not know what to say to him. I just sat there eating my tacos. Thank you. <laughs> Listening and empathizing with him just as best I could. But I didn't know what to say. And I'll tell you, the truth is, he's not some incredibly selfish person. He wanted to be blessed so he could bless others, so he could bless his community, so he could help his church. He cares deeply. And that's why he was so deeply frustrated by this. By what seemed to him to be like losing the blessing of God. You see, what is true for him, it's true for all of us to more of a less extent. We all want God's blessing. We all want to be blessed. We want good things. We want our best life now. I mean, why do you think hashtag blessed is constantly one of the top trending hashtags? If you don't know what that is, just search hashtag blessed sometime. Uh, on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all the socials. In fact, an article in the New York Times wrote this about this. Uh, I thought it was really funny. Uh, it wrote, calling something blessed has become the go-to term for those who want to boast about an accomplishment while pretending to be humble. It gets better. Fish for a compliment. Acknowledge a success without sounding too conceited or purposely elicit envy. And that is true. <laughs> That's what you see if you search hashtag blessed. So I did it a little bit. Uh, hashtag blessed goes with everything, right? Uh, getting your workout in, hashtag blessed. You got a new car with Bumblebee in the background for some reason. I'm not sure why. Uh, he's in the background. Hashtag blessed. Sunset on a beach, hashtag blessed. You're walking on the street. Actually, you have friends, 
Yes, better all smile, hashtag blessed. You're walking on the street in some foreign village with your significant other, take a picture, hashtag blessed. Now, I'm not showing these Instagram posts just to make fun of people, but to point to something. You see, our culture and we are confused about what it means to be blessed. I mean, who doesn't want a new car, go to a fancy hotel, to travel, to have friends? But if that's how we define blessing, you see, we're in for a lot of disappointment in life. But not only do we want to be blessed, we want to bless others. And I know this is true of you because if you believe in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and God blesses. It's an essential part of his character. And so it's a part of ours, right? Parents, they work hard to make money, not only for themselves, but so that they can provide for their families, their children. We climb the corporate ladder to try to bless our family. We seek to succeed in business so that we have something to retire on so we don't have to be what we call a burden to our children. And that's what Genesis 39 shows us, how to be an agent of God's blessing. How can we be an agent of God's blessing to those around us? But as we answer that question, you see, we've, we've got to figure out what blessing means. How does God define blessing? What does it really mean to be blessed? And what does it look like to bless others? And what we'll see is that Joseph's life didn't match up with our Americanized versions of blessing. So in Genesis 39, as Bailey read, we'll see God blessing others through Joseph. And uh, as, we, as you guys turn there, if you'd like, let me give you a bit of context just to set the scene for what's going on as we've been reading in the Pentateuch, which you should have gotten all the way through Genesis by today, by the way. So Todd spoke on what uh, the Abrahamic covenant was and in the Abrahamic covenant last week in Genesis 12. You see, that was God's promise to Abraham to make his family a great nation and to a blessing to the entire world. And then almost directly after, we see Abraham and Sarah just unwilling to wait on God for a son for the promise God made. And so Abraham, he sleeps with his slave and he has a kid. And then what happened here was Abraham and Sarah, they tried to gain the blessing God promised through their own scheming and their own work. And in the middle of that, sinning. In fact, from Abraham's time up to his great grandson's time, Joseph, that's the pattern. Isaac takes after Abraham, tells foreign kings that his wife is his sister. Jacob schemes to get the blessing so many times that was already promised to him. If anything, the picture throughout Genesis is of God blessing Abraham's descendants despite themselves. But then we come to Joseph and Joseph shows us a different picture. He's so much more righteous than them. See, now Joseph, he seemed to want God's blessing. I mean, he said as much to his brothers He had dreams that his brothers and his parents would bow down to him. And then he made the mistake of telling them about it. It was not a good decision. Uh, So his brothers, they stripped him of his coat that his dad had made him. They nearly killed him. But last second, change of heart, they decided to sell him to slave traders. So kind. And then we get to Genesis 39, where we see Joseph's recognition, his faithfulness, and the consequences of his faithfulness. So let's look at the blessings that came through Joseph the slave. First, we see recognition, success through Joseph as a slave. Success through Joseph as a slave. So let's look at these blessings. In verse two, it says, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man and he was in the house. You see, Joseph, he didn't need to work out in the field anymore. He was actually in the house of his Egyptian master. By the way, notice here, Potiphar isn't named again in the story. He's never named again. He is always the master or Egyptian. In verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. You see, even Potiphar noticed that God was with him and caused that success. Verse 4, so Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. So Potiphar at least was smart in this. He knew Joseph would help him to do well. And so he put him in charge of everything. Then verse five, 
From the time he made him overseer in his house to over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. Verse 6, so he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. So with the Lord causing everything Joseph does to succeed, to multiply, to just be awesome, his master puts him in charge of everything. Except, and I think this is great, Potiphar cares enough about his food that he was still concerned about the food he ate. I mean, he must have really liked food because everything else doesn't matter, but food is what he cares about. But anyway, you can see here, the blessings, they're just flowing through Joseph to this Egyptian Potiphar. And if you remember Todd's sermon last week, this is God's promise to Abraham continuing. Other families of the earth are being blessed through Abraham's offspring, which is pretty amazing. I mean, even multiple descendants down, and we we get to see that already happening. Okay, so you might be asking, how is he blessed? I mean, I get that he's in charge of everything, but he's still a slave. And to that I say, good question. I mean, it shows I'm not the only cynical person in here, first of all, which is great to know. Because... From the way that we see blessing, he doesn't seem to be blessed, right? I mean, he's still a slave. His own brothers had sold him to slave traders. And that, by any account, is terrible. He had no freedom. He couldn't just leave and go back home to confront his brothers. He was someone else's property. But that's not all. You see, he's taken from his family, his people, the land that he knew, He's completely alone in a foreign land, a place he's never been before, with no way to even defend himself. And he's 17. I mean, he's a teenager. Plus, at this most vulnerable time, God is completely silent. In contrast to all the other patriarchs throughout Genesis, God never speaks to Joseph. And throughout this account, In all of Genesis, God, he never speaks to him. And yet, God's word says he is blessed. You see, his blessing, it wasn't anything that we normally would see as a blessing, right? It wasn't money. He had none. Everything he went, he made went to his owner. It wasn't family. That was taken from him. It wasn't love. That doesn't happen for him. It wasn't a brand new fancy gold chariot. I could go on here with all the things that it wasn't. But the blessing, his blessing, it's really simple, but it's incredibly profound. It's in verse two. In verse two, the Lord, Yahweh, was with Joseph. Yahweh was with Joseph. He didn't speak to him. He didn't need to. He was with him. Even in the midst of the worst time of his life, in the midst of the circumstances that would cause most men to give up, to live their le- the rest of their life angry and mad at the world, Yahweh was with him. God was with him. You see, the secret to an abundant life isn't all the things that we do or what we make or who is around us. The secret to blessing isn't about us making lots of money or being the best. The secret is God with us, Emmanuel. If you're a believer in here today, God is with you. The Holy Spirit dwells inside you. No matter what circumstances you face in life, that truth remains. You are blessed beyond measure because God is with you. The blessing is God. The blessing is God with you. And because God was with Joseph, blessing flowed through him to Potiphar. And it's almost reached a cliche level at this point, but I'll say it anyway. He was blessed to be a blessing. Because God is with us, we want to be agents of blessing to the world around us. We are blessed to be a blessing to those around us, even in our most dire circumstances. Let me give you just one example of many that I could. There's a family in FBC. They're friends of mine. And the husband and dad, he's had cancer and gone through chemo and and all of that multiple times. The most recent time this cancer came back, and I've got to be honest, I had lost hope. I thought for sure that we would be grieving him really soon. 
But I remember distinctly when I was praying with him and asking how he was doing one time, and we were sitting down, and I don't know how else to explain this, but there was a glow around him. The hope that he had, it was amazing. It was energetic. I can still picture it in my mind. Here's this man going through some of the scariest moments of his life, and he's praising God and praying for the opportunity to be a witness to the doctors, the nurses, all of those who are helping him. Now get this, his hope wasn't in a long life or making it through all of this. I mean, he was ready to go. If that's what God's will for him was, he was ready. He truly had the attitude of to live as Christ and to die as gain. His hope and energy though came from God with him. And God blessed me through him. His actions and his attitude can only be explained by God. And he blessed not only me, but the doctors, the nurses, the people who visited him while he was in the hospital, and many people here at FBC. Right? We all want that, right? We all want to be agents of God's blessing to others despite our circumstances. But how can we do that? Well, as we continue to look in Joseph's story, we catch a picture of how he was able to be such an agent of God's blessing, even as his circumstances go from bad to worse. Look with me. Second, faithful. Joseph's integrity despite sexual harassment. Joseph's integrity despite sexual harassment. So here's what's happening in the story here. We, we see this in the second part of verse 6. Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. A phrase that's only used for him and his mother in the entire Old Testament. So he was the Zac Efron of Genesis. Yeah, see, some people know. Yeah, good looking man. And that caused a huge problem for him because Potiphar's wife, who, by the way, and this is important, is only ever named as his master's wife. That's her identity in Genesis. She decides that she wants Joseph. And so she commands him, lie with me. Now, remember this, Joseph is a slave. And in ancient Egypt, Potiphar, the master, could have laid with any slave he chose to. I mean, there was nothing illegal about that, including, I mean, honestly, Joseph. But Potiphar's wife didn't have that right. And so Potiphar's wife decides that it's, if it's okay for Potiphar, it should be okay for her. And I do want to just state the obvious here. It shouldn't be all right for anyone to ever be able to command that of anyone. But that's the world that they were living in. So then Joseph refused her. He tells her that his master has put him in charge of everything. Potiphar hasn't kept anything from him except his wife. And then he says these words, and these words are so important to remember. He says, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? I mean, do you see that? Joseph recognizes that to do this isn't just a sin against his master. It's not just a sin against Potiphar. It wouldn't just put his life in peril. He knows that to do this would be a sin against God. And that gave him the power to refuse her. Joseph had incredible integrity. Even though he recognizes that there's just, there is just one thing that is kept from him, which even from the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, that was an excuse to sin. There's only one tree you can't eat from. Enjoy all the joy and beauty of God's garden, but avoid this one tree so they eat from the one tree. I mean, Joseph, he doesn't take that as an excuse to sin. He sees the same thing that they saw as a reason for loyalty to God. But as we know, she doesn't give up. And in verse 10, the text says, day after day, she harassed him. But he wouldn't listen to her and he avoided her as much as he could. But his days turned into weeks and then years. He couldn't avoid her forever. So then in verse 11, he ends up in the house alone with her while, he, while he's trying to work. And she grabs him and says the only thing that she ever says to him, lie with me. But Joseph, he wiggles out of his coat and he gets out of the house. And I've got to say, I mean, Joseph just can't keep, his, getting, keep from getting his clothes taken. First, it's his first coat again, every time. Always gets his clothes taken. So weird. Poor guy. So at this point, she is done with this slave. 
She's so furious. She makes up this story that Joseph tried to rape her. First, she tells the men, the other servants, and then she tells her husband. And she presents Joseph's coat, which she took as evidence. And of course, Potiphar, he's enraged too. What husband wouldn't be? I mean, raping someone was an atrocious crime even then in ancient Egypt. But you see, Joseph's integrity in not obeying her, can, her command has put him here. He's falsely accused of raping the woman that was constantly trying to take advantage of him. Now, a lot of people, preachers, commentators, they'll make a big deal about this incredible sexual temptation that Joseph must have been under. That it would have just been overwhelming, this amount of, of sexual temptation he must have had. Now, the only problem with that is it's not in the actual text of Scripture. It's not in God's Word. There isn't even a mention of Joseph being sexually tempted by this command. And get that, there's not a picture here of her seducing him. She only ever says three words to him. Lie with me. I mean, that's not very seductive. It's just a command. I think people are reading our culture's temptations, which happen to be that, into this text, instead of reading the Bible plainly for what it is. In fact, what she does here is she serves more to just show how bad Joseph's life was. That he had to keep dealing with her constant sexual harassment. That he couldn't get away from because he's a slave. But I do believe there's a temptation here for him. It just wasn't purely sexual. Now, he would have needed to say yes to her and to violate his integrity to do this. But the temptation, it more closely resembles that temptation that Abraham faced. And you remember Abraham's promise to have a large nation but he was getting old and he didn't have any kids. And so in his lack of trust and his impatience with God, he sleeps with his wife's servant to get God's blessing on his terms. Well, you remember how Joseph dreamed that his entire family is going to bow down to him. But now he's a slave. I mean, he must have been wondering how would these dreams ever get fulfilled? How would what he saw so clearly in his dream ever actually happen? Well, I mean, granting some sexual favors to the captain of Pharaoh's guard, his wife, I mean, it could have helped him propel him into a better situation. Maybe she knew Pharaoh's wives. Maybe if she was happy with him, she'd put a good word in for him. Maybe he could take what he saw in his dream into his own hands. Surely granting the command that his master's wife gave him would help him to achieve those dreams. But Joseph righteous man that he is, he doesn't give in to the temptation. He utterly and completely shuts it down. So I ask, do you ever face temptations? Temptations to take what you deserve. Maybe you've been underpaid by the same company for years. You've been working your tail off and you've not getting that pay raise or the promotion that you know you deserve. So what, if you, what it, so what does it matter if you take home the company pins or you use your expense account for personal stuff? I mean, that company's not gonna miss it. And hey, they owe you anyway. Or the temptation that far too many men, and at least according to statistics, if I can get that word out, more and more women as well. You're on your computer or your phone and hey, those pictures are already out there. So what does it hurt to look? And then you find yourself down the hole of pornographic sexual addiction that will destroy your witness. There are a million and one temptations that we all face daily. Temptations that all boil down to losing our integrity and our faithfulness to God. And so I ask, what temptations do you face? So Joseph sees success as a slave at least for his master, and he remains faithful to God, staying pure in his integrity. Now let's see where his integrity got him. The consequence of his integrity, consequence, success through Joseph as a prisoner. Success through Joseph as a prisoner. So this is where his integrity, his faithfulness to God got him. Rewarded for not doing the wrong thing with prison time. Look at verse 20, verse 20, and Joseph's master took him and put him into prison. You see, the irony here is that because Joseph refused to betray Potiphar's trust, 
Potiphar ended up throwing him into prison. And now Joseph's situation gets even worse. He's not only a slave, now he's a prisoner. But in the midst of this, we get a hint of God's providence and his design here. As we continue in verse 20, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. So even though Joseph, he's in prison, he might not be any further away from the Pharaoh. But then as we continue in verse 21, we see language that very closely mirrors how God blessed Potiphar through Joseph. And so we read in verse 21, but the Lord, that's Yahweh again, was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love, hesed, God's loyal covenant love. He showed that to Joseph and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in it in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. And again, Joseph does everything. Verse 23, the keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge. And again, the master doesn't have to pay attention to anything because Joseph's taking care of it because the Lord was with him. And again, it's because Yahweh is with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. And again, it's the Lord that makes him succeed. So even though Joseph is thrown even lower than before, I mean, he's in prison now. God's blessings, they're flowing through him to all those around him, definitely to the prison keeper. I mean, he doesn't have to pay attention really to anything. Now that Joseph's there, he's got it easy. Surely the prisoners are also blessed because a well-kept prison is a little bit better place to stay than a poorly kept one. Not a lot, but maybe a little bit. And all of this is because God was with Joseph. You see, when God is with you, it doesn't even matter if you're in prison. You can still be a blessing to those around you. I saw this really clearly when something somewhat similar happened to a family here at FBC. You see, my friend, he's traveling, and he was arrested based on a warrant that shouldn't have ever happened, ever been issued. And the warrant was out there for a crime that he clearly didn't commit. There was video evidence that showed it wasn't him. But because of some government, I mean, frankly, incompetence, he languished in jail. He had every reason to get bitter and angry with God, with the government, with the guy who actually did the crime, and multiple other people. But you see, the most amazing thing happened. While he's in jail, I started hearing these stories of how he's getting opportunities to share the gospel with people who are in jail with him. These prayer requests I'm seeing are, from him are, are that he get opportunities to witness to those around him. I mean, it's just amazing stuff. You see, that's a man who didn't let the temptation to bitterness to get to him who saw his circumstances as an opportunity to let God bless others through him that he wouldn't normally come into contact with because he doesn't normally end up in jail. I mean, he's a good man who stayed faithful to God even in some awful circumstances. And I'm glad he's a part of our church. Joseph, he saw success for his master as a slave. He remained faithful to God, staying pure. And even as he was thrown into prison, Joseph was successful for the jailer. And God's blessings, they poured out of Joseph as he stayed faithful to God, no matter the circumstances. Here's the point I think we can take from the passage. The point, conduct, be pure and be a blessing. Be pure and be a blessing. Your integrity, your purity, it enables you to be a more effective conductor of God's blessing to others. And now I, I feel like I need to say this. We don't stay pure so that we can get God's blessing, but so that we can more effectively share the blessing that is already ours with others. God's blessing is God with us. Your goal is to simply share the blessing you have because of Jesus Christ with others. You see, God stays with you no matter what. His promise to never leave you or forsake you holds true no matter what you do. Now, let me explain what I mean by, effect, by a more effective conductor. How you can be a more effective conductor. And I've got to say, I'm not an electrician. That's my brother. 
And so this might not be totally technically correct. So engineers in here, here, you can email me later. I know there's a lot, and you can just tell me how I'm wrong. It's okay. Uh, here's how I understand about conductors. A conductor of electricity allows electricity to pass through it. And metal is a much more effective conductor than something like rubber. And the more effective metals are those more pure metals. So gold, pure gold, pure silver. Silver or gold that's been refined to get all the impurities out. It's a better conductor than unrefined gold. It's the same for us. You see, our purity makes us more effective conductors of God's blessings to others. Or our lack of purity clogs up our effectiveness. All that junk and the sin that entangles us, it keeps us from being able to be as effective as we would be, as effective of a conductor of God's blessing. But how can we be pure and be a blessing to the world? First, flee temptation. Recognize what it is. It's a temptation to great wickedness, to sin against God, the one who cares deeply for you. And then second, don't try to be perfect before seeking to be a blessing. You'll never achieve perfection. Don't try to act like you're perfect either. Admit your faults to others and that will bless them as well. And then share God's character in word and deed. So our God, he's a generous God. Be generous with your time, your energy and money. Our God, he's love. So show love to those around you, to those that are hard to like. And then God, he cares for the poor, the fatherless, the widows. Find ministries that support them or support them yourselves as individuals. And we do this all over the place as a church. And I'm so excited about this. You see our children's ministry, it opens up the indoor playground to the community at times in the summer so that when it's blazing hot outside, kids have a safe and a cool place uh, to play while their parents can interact. Wynn and Kathy Harvey, friends of mine, who are church members here, are incredibly generous with their time. They spend much of it at a local public school, just showing God's love, supporting the students there by their presence. Another friend of mine, he's a coach at a local gym here, but he uses these, his incredibly long hours to show God's love and to care about people that would most likely never come through the doors of a church but he takes his blessing and he shares God's character with others. Our 21.5 projects, they're all about this, but I'll get that to, to that in a second. Now I could go on and on with examples of how you are doing this. And I have to say, church, keep up the good work, relying on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And know this, even as we look to the story of Joseph, it points us straight to Jesus. You see, Jesus in many ways is the true and better Joseph. See, Joseph was righteous, unwilling to sin against God. Jesus was perfectly righteous, completely and totally without sin. As Joseph was wrongly accused and punished for a crime he didn't commit, so was Jesus. Jesus' punishment was the crucif crucifixion of the perfect God-man for the sins of the world that he willingly endured for us. And the great irony that Joseph's enemies thought that they had won when he descended into the pit or when he descended into jail, but it was God's providence to bless the world. And the great irony that Satan, God's enemy, thought he had won when Jesus died and descended into the tomb, but Jesus had the final victory of death and of sin as he rose three days later in newness of life to not only bless those suffering from a famine, but all people suffering from the plague of a broken world. So as you look to be pure and to be a blessing, look to Joseph, but look to Jesus. The one that we can depend on, that we rely on. So what's the next step here? On your handout, uh, on the online notes and on the bulletin on the connection card, you'll see four steps, specific ways that you can apply this. First, find someone or some people to talk through the discussion questions with. We say this every week, but I'll say it again. We grow in community together as we talk about God's word. Life is better connected and the Bible is better applied with others. 
Talk to your small group, your family, your life transformation group, your t-ball team, your baseball team, your softball team, soccer team, whoever and wherever. Just talk to people about the Bible. Share the Bible with others. Second, read week three in the Pentateuch reading plan. We're continuing to read through the Pentateuch. We're going through the first five books of the Bible over seven weeks. So you miss Genesis. Start with us in Exodus. That's all right. Pick something. Pick one of them up on the, in the foyer on your way out. You can keep following with us from there. Grab the plan at the community life desk. Third, pray that you would be pure and be a blessing. Pray for purity. Pray for the courage to flee temptation. Pray to rely on God to let him work through you this week as an agent of his blessing, to be a conductor, and to be more effective at it. And then finally, commit to at least one of the 21.5 projects. So this is our third year, I believe, as a church to do the 21 projects over five weeks. And these projects, they're all about blessing our community. So you were handed a sheet with your bulletin when you walked in. It looked like this. I want to encourage you to look through that. Take the time to look through that. Commit to doing at least one. Some of them are ongoing throughout the five weeks, and some happen at a particular day and time. There's lots of different kinds of projects as well. I mean, depending on your gifting and your time constraints, there's construction and prayer, supplies that are needed, many other types of opportunities for you to be able to be a blessing to others. Look them over, commit to doing at least one of them. If you have any questions about any of them, Steve Vance, he'll be in the foyer uh, at the outreach desk, which is on the other side of that wall. Ask any questions that you want. I mean, I can answer some, but he can answer all of them. Uh, And he'll also sign you up for the ones that you need to sign up for. Encourage you, do that. Commit to just one. If we all committed to just one, we would be able to really make an impact on our community in an amazing way. If you want to commit to doing more than one, that's awesome. But I encourage you, don't just take this week and just go buy it again, but commit to doing one of those. So here's four ways to respond. Share, study, pray, practice. Check them off on your care card that's attached to your bulletin. Put that in the offering, or not the offering. I say that whenever I'm talking about giving. Put them in the foyer, the boxes in the foyer as you leave. Uh, That way we as a church pastors, as pastors and elders can be praying for you this week as you seek to apply his word. And we really do love to pray for you. Uh, So if you put your name on that, uh, we'll pray for you. If you leave it anonymous, we'll still pray for you, but we'd like to be able to pray for you by name. So encourage you to put your name on that and we'll be praying for you this week as you seek to apply his word. Uh, So be pure, be a blessing. Your integrity enables you to be a more effective conductor of God's blessing to others. I wanna ask you, uh, will you stand with me as uh, as I pray? If you can. If you can't, that's okay. Uh, Now let's pray. Father God, you dwell in purity. You are totally holy. You are completely righteous. Yet you bless us with your presence. You are with us. Even though we don't feel deserving. Would you forgive us of our trespasses? Forgive us of our sins. Make us pure and holy. May we be holy even as you are holy. May we be pure even as you are pure. Let us rely on your spirit as we seek to be instruments, conductors, agents of your blessing in this community this week and beyond. It is in the name of the Son and by the power of the Spirit that we pray. Amen. Now, before you leave, I'm going to invite the prayer team to come up. These are uh, staff and pastor, elders that would love to pray with you. We'd love to talk with you about anything at all. We'll stick around here a bit after the service. Come and talk with us. We'd love to get to pray with you. Uh, So in conclusion, God's blessing is simple. He's with us. We can rest in that truth no matter what the circumstances are. 
So may we go out this week as pure agents of blessing to the world around us. Now, thank you for being here. You're dismissed. Hang out in the foyer as long as you want. Ask questions, sign up for stuff, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.